All right. Thank you, Marty. And as uh, Marty alluded to, myself and David Raff are uh, are going to be presenting remotely. I'm at my house right now, and uh, you know, as we go through this, and we're all kind of in in this pandemic and um, quarantine, you know, hope that everyone is staying healthy first and foremost, and is uh, doing well. We appreciate you taking the time today to join us and as we you know do a brief recap of of the first quarter so far this year and and discuss some of the points and uh data that that we're looking at as uh advisors and as part of the investment committee and and obviously this this virus and the coronavirus is is on top of many folks minds and so that will be a big basis of this um you know i know at this point for for me personally, and I hope for for a lot of those out there, you know, celebrating the little things, uh, the little wins, as as we call them in our household. You know, being Friday, we're uh, and I have I have three kids, five and under, but uh, Fridays for us is pizza night, so we'll do pizza and uh, watch a movie with the boys, and uh, like I said, just trying to celebrate the small things here. So, with that, why don't we uh, get started into the presentation? So, wanted to start with this. Um, not to make light of of the current situation that that we find ourselves in, but um, you know, talking about multiple ways to distance, it actually echoes a lot of the conversations that I've personally had with with many of the clients that that I've reached out to and had conversations with. In terms of, you know, many folks have have shared that they really haven't looked very closely at their portfolios, and uh, you know, they allude to the the trust they put in uh, to our team at Boucher Financial Group and uh, you know through all this we we do appreciate that trust and the confidence that you have placed in in our team and I can assure you we're on daily calls and webinars um, as a team making sure that that we're doing all we can to uh, you know do the best we can with with your portfolios and how we're uh, you know managing this current crisis but you know aside from just just the portfolios and you know, obviously that's a big part of what we do. And, you know, many of the clients that, that have shared, they haven't been looking, have been pleasantly surprised based on uh, some of the defensive things that we've done. And, and we'll talk about that later in the presentation. But, you know, the big thing through this and, and one of the, the services that we continue to provide our clients, even, even remotely, is working on financial plans. And, you know, I've had some conversations with a few clients who have shared that, uh, you know, this is going to, set back my retirement two, three, five years. And and when we get into the actual plan itself and we really look at the numbers, uh, you know, I think this has less impact than um you may think, uh, you know, especially right now. And I know these these times are tough and there's so many, so many uncertainties, but um I I will share that I think uh if you do have uncertainties or you're nervous about anything, with regard to your financial situation, please reach out to myself, Marty, uh, Stephen, my father, Steve, anyone that you work with, and uh, you know we'll we'll work with you, Paulo, Harmony, we'll work with you to put your you know update your plan or put a plan in place, uh, and and I think that goes a long ways to um, you know giving some some confidence through these these trying times. So let's look at the recap from um, the first quarter. We can look at so here we go so you know looking at equities so far in, in in the equity market again u.s large caps continue to lead the way uh you know not in the the way that we had hoped but being down only 20 percent versus small cap equities which were down 30 percent international developed so again that's European countries Japan they were down almost 23 percent and emerging markets for the quarter were down a little bit more than 23%. You look at the bond index, uh, U.S. bonds, the the U.S. bond aggregate index was about flat for the for the first quarter. Uh, with commodities, you know, commodities have have lagged for for so long now, and uh, they've really taken the brunt of of this lower demand uh, environment right now, being down again more than 23%. We don't have any direct exposure to 
uh, commodities, but you can see they've they've been beaten up so far in, in this first quarter with everything going on around us. If we go to the next slide to look at the visualization of this, again, you can, it's just using all that same data, but here you can see it. And, you know, just as a point frame of reference, we hit our peak in the markets on about February 19th. Um, we began raising cash uh, the following week, I think February 25th or 26th was, was the first round of cash that we raised. We raised more the two days following that. Um, so we, we were pretty early thinking that this could be uh, more widespread and uh, went into more of a defensive posture early on. Uh, the only thing I will point out with this chart is when, when you sit back and you ask about uh, you know, what is that purpose of bonds, especially in low interest rate environments? Uh, for some time, they can feel as though they're doing nothing for you. But as we've seen, when, when volatility spikes and we have uh, these risks that we don't see, uh, this is when bonds really earn their clout in the portfolio. And this is why not everyone is invested in a hundred percent equity portfolio. And that's okay. You know, bonds serve their purpose uh, during certain times, maybe they don't work in your favor at all times, but there are uh, time frames that that they hold up in and they help propel the portfolio. So why don't we take a look at where we are from a tactical perspective so far and, and where we sit today. So again, we continue to be overweight U.S. equities. I'm sure you saw the email from my father a few weeks ago. Uh, where we we don't hold any international equities at the moment. So from our equities that we do hold, uh, U.S. equity tilt, uh, we continue to be overweight technology uh, versus maybe the last two recessions and or bear markets that we've experienced, the financial crisis and the tech bubble. Uh, technology stocks have performed very well. It's It's a much different set of companies that are out there today, companies are actually making money. And given how most people are working, the fact that we can hold this presentation virtually with you, uh, the fact that our office is, is fully operational, even from uh, remote locations for all of our employees, shows you the value today of technology. And that's been a sector that's held up incredibly well so far. Uh, before this uh, pandemic and, and the fear really started, uh, we had gone more into some low volatility uh, ETFs. That was a um, decision that the investment committee made uh, to round out as as you know as we were ending 2019 and heading into 2020. We wanted um, some exposure to lower volatility stocks. Uh, we continue to have uh, a dividend yielding stock tilt, uh, some value oriented companies there. And currently, right now, as we've talked about. Um, we're overweight cash in, in, in positions that we've raised over the last four to five weeks. Uh, continue to underweight, we don't hold any international equities, uh, high volatility stocks, and in your, in your fixed income portion of the portfolio, we do not hold any high yield debt. Everything that we hold is, is more corporate grade or uh, you know, U.S. government debt. Uh, we do have some international debt, but again, um, we, we steer clear of that high yielding debt um, holdings because we really feel that fixed income side of the portfolio is there to be uh, the counterweight to more uh, growth oriented stocks. So for the first section we wanna talk about a little bit, we'll, we'll discuss, you know, obviously the coronavirus. This, is, this has been a huge um, talking point in driving a lot of what's going on in the market. So we'll, we'll look a little bit at the current and uh, future impact. So, this first slide, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but it is pretty uh, staggering just when you look at a chart like this and, and see how the U.S. has been affected uh, thus far. This this graph goes back to last week, and you know that that number is only rising. And, and really, what we're looking to get to is that that point of flattening and or lowering that that curve. Uh, when you go to the next slide, it doesn't look as bad as that, that first slide did, when you compare it as a per capita basis, uh, you know, the United States in that first slide looked really bad. Uh, when you look at it here, more middle of the pack when you when you factor in uh, per capita our infection rate. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a epi epi 
epime epidemi I, I'm I'm stuck on the word, but no expert in in infectious diseases, but it you know you wonder if it's if it's better if if we find out that more people have carried this and and have been exposed to this as as time goes on because uh that may make it quicker for us to to get back to work to get back to how things uh were before this entire episode started i want to look at you know one of the the worst graphs that that you could see uh this doesn't include the number that came out yesterday which was another four and a half million folks. But uh, you you look at this and it's just absolutely staggering that over the last five weeks, uh, over 26 million Americans have filed for first time unemployment benefits. Uh, you know, you look back over the last 50 years or so, uh, we don't even scratch the surface of claims for a given week of, of 1 million, let alone uh, multiple weeks in a row of more than 6 million. Yesterday was another four and a half million, and uh, this is just really an unprecedented time, uh, both in our economy and in probably stock market when we look back on everything. Uh, how is how are these things impacting, um, you know, certain sectors? And so wanted to kind of look at the service industry and uh, how these employment numbers could be affected. When you look at it, you, know, you think about restaurants and the entertainment industry and you know it maybe seems from a from a high level that it's a smaller portion of our economy but really it, it makes up over 30 million jobs uh, about 20 percent of all payroll jobs in this industry is is currently really getting decimated and uh kind of when you look at a chart like this and, and you factor in the 30 million people that uh you know i'm sure they're companies are slowing down or, or they've been furloughed or lost work uh, and you you factor in that it's it's close to 20 percent of all payroll jobs i mean that's a that's a huge number and that's going to have a really really big impact as we continue to navigate this this situation you can go to the next slide and we look at uh just how much consumers spend in this industry and uh let me just get to the next slide um, but we talk about the U.S. consumer all the time. Uh, the consumer makes up about two thirds of, of overall GDP. Um, and in these service industries, um, about 20% of GDP, similar to the 20% of payroll jobs. There we go. Um, 20% of our uh, GDP goes towards these industries. Again, these industries that are having, you know, have been having forced by the government to shut their doors, uh, to change their business models, even the ones that are still operating and in, in are in business, maybe doing, you know, takeout orders are, are operating with a, a fraction of what the employees they had before. Um, so you, you look at what this impact could have, you know, now, and even as we start to reopen, I think it's going to have some real um, lasting impacts in the, uh, you know, whether you're saying the next six months, 12 months, uh, I do think at, at some point we will get back to normal, but, you know, right now, uh, th this industry is, makes up a huge part of our country and, uh, you know, they're really having a tough time right now. Another topic I want to get into, uh, especially given what transpired on Monday is oil and the price of oil. So, you know, Long story short, if you followed it on Monday, um, the price of May contracts for a barrel of oil went from about $18 to negative $37. Not only could you not give a barrel of oil away for free, you had to pay someone $37 to take that contract off your hands. Now, what does that mean getting to a negative number like that? Well, you know, for the most part, this was more of a, a trading issue um, in terms of traders being stuck with this contract but there's significant fear in this industry and there's going to be again a lasting impact in a in in an industry that you know has a pretty pretty solid footing in in the u.s economy um with how you know right now there's just no demand i don't know you know in our own personal lives we probably average as a family going to the gas pump more than once a week typically and 
you know, I'll tell you what, over the last five to six weeks, we haven't been to the gas pump once. We haven't needed to. And I'm sure uh, that's similar to, to many folks that are out there right now. So there is no de- not only no demand for oil, but there's nowhere to put it because no one's purchasing it. And so um, right now, that's the big issue is that you know, they're finding it harder and harder to find places to store this oil. And so no one wants to be left holding the bag of, I have to accept this oil in May for those May contracts. So, um, you know, the May contracts expired on Monday into Tuesday. A lot of that had to do with trading. Uh, right now for June contracts, that's up closer to about $20 a barrel right now. So um, that's probably more in line with the actual true cost of a bo- barrel of oil. But still, when you think about our, our big um, U.S. manufacturers here, you really, to, to start breaking even on oil and to turn a profit, oil needs to trade for a barrel around $30, give or take. Uh, so we're still below that number. And uh, there's still going to be a lot of stress to that industry as we move forward. The last point I will bring up, because you may have heard this, and, and I want to relate it to our use of ETFs. Um, there's there's an exchange traded product called USO that is supposed to mirror um, the price of oil, and this got a lot of headlines earlier in the week as well because you know it's really not doing that. And the big reason why is that this product is tied to these futures contracts. It's a very complex product, and it's it's tied to a lot of underlying um, derivatives that aren't fully in line with the price of oil. So you know if you're doing any of your trading at home, or if you have questions based on the fear of, of an exchange traded product that we could use, this is something we do not use. We're, we're using more of the traditional products that really do um, base the price on underlying equities, you know, the, the S&P 500, the QQQs of the world. Um, this USO product is a much, much different product than anything that we're using. And uh, just wanted to reiterate that that this is something that we do not and will not use, um, but I'm sure it's something that that you may have heard about, um, especially with given everything that transpired again with oil on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, you know, the last thing not to not to belabor the point on oil, but um, you know, just as a frame of reference. Uh, more than 40%, almost 45% of oil demand does go towards, you know, just cars and trucks on the road. Um, you know, the the transportation and, and the driving of, of consumers like like we do every day. And like I said, to my own um, personal anecdote, where I haven't been to the gas pumps in, in probably five or six weeks, I'm sure a lot of people are in the same, same boat. So, um, you know, the big reason right now is that there's really that demand on a, on a global basis has has completely dried up. And, uh, you know, this is something that that we're looking at, but, you know, may take some time depending on how we um, open up our economy um, moving forward. So just to recap kind of what's going on in our current environment, um, you know, right now we really don't feel as though uh, the stock market and, and where it's priced today is not fully reflective of uh, the current economic conditions. You know, the current ec- economic conditions feel a lot worse. You think about it, we've lost 26 million jobs in just the last five weeks alone. Um, we've now lost every single job that was created coming out of the financial crisis back in 2009. The other number that was staggering when I read it the other day in the, the Wall Street Journal is that 9 million jobs were lost during the entire 07 and 09 recession. We've lost more than that in two weeks. So, you know, this is a significant, uh, you know, economic crisis that we do see ourselves in right now. Um, you know, hopefully it is short lived, but, um, you know, it is, it is significant. Uh, you know, we feel as though this thing won't fully be able to just kind of switch back on the economy. I do think um, what's going on in Georgia is opening some businesses today. I think it's going to be a good test case as to how many businesses do open up. I know a lot that can open are refusing to open. Um, they're still worried about the impact. Um, and we'll see kind of this brings on additional cases of, of the coronavirus. And lastly, you know, we need to be prepared for what's to come. You know, there is a potential of a second wave of this in the fall. And if so, you know, what does that mean from an economic standpoint? Again, are we going to be in a situ- similar situation as we are today? Are we going to be better off, you know, handling it? Um, but we do have to be ready that that these guidelines may just be just as strict as they are today. So 
something that again we're we're going to follow closely and in, in trying to monitor to uh, dictate our our investment decisions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marty to talk a little bit about you know what the Fed's been doing throughout this. Thank you, Ryan. So uh, if you've been watching the news, uh, you know that the uh, actions of the federal government and the Federal Reserve have been substantial. Really, it's just amazing, uh, both on the size of the um, intervention and how quickly it's come about. Uh, and without a doubt, that has uh, been beneficial for a lot of businesses and a lot of people. Uh, and it's definitely a big reason why the markets are not down substantially more than they are. Uh, it's been a big support for the markets. And again, for individuals and families and businesses, it's been uh, very significant. And this slide gives you an idea of the comparison of what we saw in 2008 and through 2010 with the federal government intervention uh, and the stimulus package. That's the light green bar on the left-hand side. And then the darker blue or green bar is where we currently stand with the intervention. And this is as a percentage of GDP. So obviously our GDP is greater now than it was 10 years ago, but you can see how much larger uh, the intervention has been in the US, but also in a number of other countries uh, with the exception of Russia, where it was larger in 2008 and 10. But without a doubt, this has been a huge reason why uh, the markets are not down substantially more than they are. Uh, and it's definitely again, beneficial for small businesses uh, and families who are struggling. <clears throat> The other piece is on the monetary side with the Federal Reserve. They've lowered the Federal Reserve rate to zero, and they've been uh, buying bonds uh, out in the open market. Uh, this graph basically shows you uh, the number of bonds they've been buying. So you can see, remember back in uh, the 2010, 12, 13, and 14 period, uh, there was the QE, right? Quantitative easing one and two and three, and that's when that, the, the line trends upwards it kind of flattened off and it was actually declining when they were selling bonds. Now you can see that they've increased the number of bonds in their balance sheet. And what they've said is they will uh, be the backstop for pretty much any investment grade corporate bond, many mortgage backed securities, uh, any market uh, money market funds, and even going into uh, some areas of uh, the higher end junk bond space. So, you know, that has been a substantial move to provide liquidity uh, to those markets and keep interest rates uh, low in those spaces. So, you know, this doesn't come without a price tag, right? Somebody's got to pay for this. And this is what this graph shows you, which is uh, as a percentage of GDP, what the federal deficit is. And now we're up over uh, 100, almost 107% uh, for our uh, national debt. I'm sorry, not deficit. Uh, so uh, the debt is the cumulative of all the deficits uh, over the years. And again, as a percentage of GDP, you can see where we are, which is substantial uh, right behind Italy and Japan. And again, we've said this before, uh, it is absolutely the case that over the long run, uh, in particular, when we get into 2030, where we have entitlements like Medicare and Social Security, they're gonna be run out of funding. This uh, federal government debt issue is gonna be a problem. It's gonna be a major problem. It's gonna need a resolution. Uh, which is going to require uh, less spending and more revenue come in to uh, reduce this problem. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about what we see as the impact more in the short term. So two questions that we've had came in from clients. Really, along the, I'm not going to go through the questions. You can read them. But along those lines, which is, what does this federal deficit mean um, from an inflation perspective? Uh, what does it mean to the portfolios? And what is our perspective of what we're going to be doing uh, to try to impact or try to prevent any impact uh, from uh, this rising deficit to the portfolio. So I'll walk you through that. So uh, if you haven't already, uh, my colleague uh, David Rath had wrote a great blog on our website, uh, webpage on um, inflation and uh, you know the rising debt and what this means. And some of these graphs are from that article. So what you can see is um, you know, the, both the public debt uh, and other debt that we see has been increasing uh, both in just dollars and as a percentage of uh, GDP. But what you can see in this graph is that, uh, relatively speaking, inflation has been very muted, uh, even that, as that been going on. 
And you know, back in 08 and 09, one of the real concerns uh, from all the fiscal stimulus uh, and increase that was inflation. And it did not uh, actually come to play out in the uh, 2010s. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the bigger concerns, and it's probably one of the concerns we have now, is deflation, right? So inflation is when prices are increasing, and higher inflation is when they're increasing at an accelerated rate. Deflation is when prices are actually decreasing, and it can be as problematic. And really what you have right now is an oversupply of commodities and an oversupply of manufacturing ability, and that can cause deflation, which can be more problematic. We have a lot of questions regarding gold and, and inflation. And, you know, relatively speaking, um, gold is a good hedge against inflation. But you can see here with this graph, this is a graph of gold prices uh, over the last uh, 30 years. And this is inflation below it. And you can see there really is not a lot of correlation between uh, inflation and gold prices. Um, so it's something that we look at uh, as any investment to potentially put in the portfolio. We have not added it right now. Um, and, you know, you can see there's not much of a correlation between the two. Um, what this graph shows, this is the, the gold bar line is the U.S. dollar. The blue is uh, gold. Um, you know, one of the potential concerns is uh, with all this uh, debt that uh, the U.S. dollar could uh, decline. Uh, and there is this would show that there's potentially some correlation between a declining U.S. dollar and you can see in the latter stage uh, increasing gold prices as the dollar decline relative to other uh, basket of currencies. But that correlation is not very strong. Uh, and, you know, relatively speaking, the U.S. dollar is, as we saw uh, about three or four weeks ago, uh, is still where everybody flocks to uh, when there's concern. So although there may be concerns with the debt that the U.S. has, there is as much concerns with the debt that other foreign countries have relative to ours. And then, you know, the question becomes, what does this mean for interest rates? And, uh, you know, relatively speaking, uh, interest rates have um, actually remained very low uh, even though we've had our debt increase uh, over the last number of years. And, um, you know, this is as a percentage of GDP. This is more likely to continue because the Federal Reserve has said that they will continue to uh, buy, they, they use the term QE, QE infinity, which basically means that they will buy as many bonds as they need to uh, in order to provide stability to the bond market, which in turn keeps interest rates low. So relatively speaking, uh, again, we absolutely think that the uh, rising national uh, debt is an issue, but it's more of a long-term issue. And from an inflationary perspective, I think the concern really more is deflation uh, because of the excess capacity that exists both in manufacturing and in commodities versus inflation. And you know, as far as the portfolios, you know, we are uh, always looking at different asset classes to add, gold being one of them. Um, but as you can see, there's not always a strong correlation between uh, inflation and gold. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the, the CARES Act. Uh, so this was passed, passed uh, into law or signed into law March 27th. It is a very extensive act uh, with a lot of different provisions. So I'm just going to spend one page going through because it would take me hours to go through all the detail. What I will say to you is if you have any specific questions, uh, regarding your situation and how the CARES Act impacts you, please reach out to us and we can give you guidance on it. Uh, but these are some of the major uh, points that impact many people. First and foremost, uh, required minimum distributions are waived for 2020. Uh, this is true for all IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, and inherited IRAs. And our general recommendation is if you don't need the money, uh, it is beneficial to uh, not take the uh, RMD, not take the distribution and let the money grow tax deferred. Uh, as many of you know, tax filing and tax payment date is del delayed until July 15th. And also estimated tax payments, if you're required to make those, uh, the ones that were due on April 15th and then due on June 15th are delayed until July 15th. Uh, also, if you or your family is impacted by COVID-19, either through job loss or through uh, getting uh, COVID-19, you can take a distribution, either a distribution or, or an increased loan from your 401k or 43B plan uh, up to $100,000. Uh, again, you're gonna really have to work. We can help you provide some guidance, but you're gonna have to work with your employer on this uh, if this is the case. 
because uh, they're going to have to make sure that uh, the way they approach it lines up with their uh, plan document. But this now is a possibility if you're impacted, and we can kind of walk you through the details if it specifically impacts you. And then finally, um, most people these days use the standard deduction when filing uh, because of the changes in the tax law. Um, so most charitable deductions are not, you, you don't write them off specifically. But there is now, uh, you can write off, even if you take a standard deduction, you can write off $300 uh, for charitable giving in 2020. Again, if you have any uh, specific questions regarding the CARES Act and how it impacts you, please uh, reach out to us and we can go through that with you. Uh, now David Rath is going to go through and give you some uh, perspective on the portfolios. Hi, Marty. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks, Marty, for, for introducing me. Um, wanted to first... I'll go over a prevailing sentiment I think that exists out in the market um, or just in the in, in the society in general, and that is that you know we've done a ton of work up till now with the social distancing and staying away from uh, businesses and staying away from other people. Is, is, is it a good time now to to get back uh, to get back out there and open up the economy? And I, I don't know if there's a right answer to this, uh, but I think that one of the risks that people are concerned with is the fact that. Um, if, if we open up too soon, uh, we can undo a lot of the good that we've already done up till now as far as controlling, uh, controlling the spread of this. So um, I, and if, if I could get to the next slide here. Yeah, so as, as you can see in this cartoon, the, um, you know, the, the guy is saying we, we can, it worked, we can get, up, get back out there. Uh, it's akin to saying, you know, the parachute stopped my fall, I can take it off now. I don't know if it's that extreme, but it, it does uh, it does represent the the conundrum that we are in as a society. Now, heading into a recession, uh, typically certain sectors are going to be impacted more than others, and we've seen in this. You know, I think it's safe to call this a recession at this point. Um, you can see the the sectors that were hit especially hard: uh, the financials, the industrials, consumer discretionary, energy. Energy would be normally hit hard anyway, but you know it, it has its own things to deal with. Um, this this chart is just uh, representing specific to the COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, what is the impact on earnings per share in quarter one of 2020? Uh, financials, you know, they have their own issues uh, as far as getting paid back and increasing their loan loss provisions uh, because they're probably going to be expecting uh, you know. A lot of people not being able to pay back their loans, and they might have to write those down. So um, the, their their impact in Q1 was seen more substantial than any of the other sectors. If we look across the world, uh, and especially into the emerging markets, um, this is a pretty staggering graph. Uh, additional people that would be caused to go into poverty um, caused by the the, the COVID-19 recession. A total of 547 million people in the emerging markets uh, would be expected to then cross into that poverty level. So as, as bad as we have it here, uh, I think a lot of the, the other uh, parts of the world, especially the more developing economies, are going to be hit uh, even harder uh, to, to, due to this because they were not in as strong of a position as we were going into it. So uh, as, as we mentioned, or as Ryan mentioned, we did take emerging markets out of the portfolio uh, a couple of weeks ago in order to, again, protect our clients' money against you know the potential you know dramatic impact uh, that we would see from something like this, uh, where you have a decent chunk of the po populations in these emerging economies uh, under the poverty line. Now, a common question is, what shape is this recovery going to take? And I think economists have somewhat settled on a V-shaped recovery. As you can see, the, the source of this is the, the IMF, which is the International Monetary Fund, uh, and their projections for uh, what contractions are going to look like this year uh, for, for most of the world. Uh, they have China at a positive 1.2 percent, um, and then the, the rebound on the other side. Uh, and I, I think that whenever you're projecting out into the future, it's going to be incredibly tough because there's so many variables at play. Uh, but I think that Many people are hoping for this V-type recovery where we bottom out in 2020 and then we come out on the other side uh, ju just as strong or even stronger. As you can see, those, those numbers coming out in 2021 are due to a lot of pent-up demand that's being assumed in these, uh, in these econometric models. So uh, the actual shape of the recovery, I think, is going to be dependent on consumers and the consumer sentiment and being, being willing to get out there and, and resume normal lives. 
normal life, but I think that there's uh, still a lot to be determined uh, as we work our way through this. Now for the expectation for the longer-term impact, I, I found it interesting that the, the people who expect things to return to normal by June, it's almost the inverse of that uh, chart of uh, who would be impacted by it the most. Uh, and you see these emerging economies like Brazil, India, and China at the top of this. I mean, China kind of had a head start on everybody, so they might be back to normal sooner than normal. Uh, but by June, you can see the developed economies like the US, UK, and Japan not really expecting a return back to normal anytime soon. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into a little bit what that new normal might look like. But I found it interesting that uh, the emerging economies are actually more positive you know, as, as far as when they're going to come out of it than some of the more developed nations. Now, we always talk about economies and the stock market. And uh, while they are related, uh, it's, it's somewhat tough to ascribe economic uh, situations to what the market's doing. And I think that the current market environment has been somewhat confusing because uh, we see all these negative news headlines. We see the amount of jobless claims and uh, what that would potentially have an impact on the stock market. And we've seen the market recover off its lows of upwards of 30% or more. And I think it's important you know, to realize that you know, the market is discounting mechanism and it's discounting months and years into the future and so what you see on the news might not necessarily correlate to what's going on in the market and we saw something similar to what we're going through right now at the end of 2018 where we saw an incredibly steep drop going into the christmas eve lows and then we saw that v-shaped bounce coming out and so uh right now we are somewhat at a crossroads when it comes to the market and the reaction of the stock market to what's going on in the economy um, and as you can see, the where we are right now, it's it's almost about 50%, 50, 60% from uh, from where we were initially at you know, before this before this all started. And this is going to determine, I think, and we'll get into it a little bit later. But this is going to determine where we are headed in the short term for the market because the market is driven by a lot of different types of forces, and one of them being the amount of liquidity that the, Fed, that, that the Fed is injecting into the system. So right now we really have a battle between the, the, the Fed liquidity and then the dire economic outlook. And, and right now we're seeing uh, somewhat of a range over the last two weeks where the market's deciding where it's going to go after this initial bounce off the lows. Now, in an environment such as this, uh, the forward price to earnings ratio is something that is fairly nebulous because you have companies that are just withdrawing their guidance and guidance is essentially what they are saying they, they would expect to earn for the future. So these are our best guess estimates of what the potential earnings, as, what the potential earnings would be for 2020 uh, for companies in the S&P 500. And as you can see, before the COVID crisis, uh, we were at about 100 and $77 per share of an S&P 500 fund as the consensus earnings estimate for 2020, that has really come down. And even the fact that we're about you know 20% uh, off the highs in the actual market, you can see that the price to earnings ratio, so the price of the market divided by the earnings expectation, has gone up to pretty, uh, pretty high levels. Uh, we'd like to see that number in the 15, 16 range, maybe even 17, 18, but because of the forward earnings estimates of the uh, S&P 500 companies, we're seeing the price divided by those earnings estimate go up to you know, somewhat high levels. Now, this is, again, just based on projections into the future. If things turn around and we're able to recoup some of those, uh, those losses in the earnings, and this is a very fluid situation, but um, you know, projecting earnings right now is, is a very, very hard thing to do. The only thing that we know at this point is what that current price is. So what the numer what the numerator is in that equation. Um, but as you can see, the right now we're headed in opposite directions as far as the expensive nature of the market and where those earnings estimates are uh, potentially going to end up. And what does this mean moving forward? We mentioned the V-shaped recovery before. There's been a lot of letters thrown out there when it comes to recovery. Um, an alternative to the V-shape is a U-shape where 
we we've already seen the drawdown uh what the you would be we kind of sit down here for a little while whether it be six months to a year or even longer and then we come back out on the other side uh in a in a pretty quick recovery i think the l shape is probably a worst case scenario what that means is we we've already saw the drawdown the l shape the, the bottom of the l would just kind of be a flat line at these current levels for for economic output um i think you know from what i read that's a lower probability event however of course you have to assign certain probabilities to, to different outcomes and then the w recovery uh is more of like a market type reaction where we've already seen the the, the second leg of that w going up uh and it's very typical for you know during a period of recession or during bear markets to have this up and down nature uh in the stock market as again we figure out where the market and where the economy is headed. Um, now, how fast can we get back to normal? As I mentioned earlier, I think that a lot of it's going to have to do with what the consumer does and how comfortable people are resuming their daily activities. And um, I think that there might be a new normal as you, as you see down below. Um, we might not be in a same situation. We, we could be in a better situation or we could be in something similar, just different. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing this webinar from home. So is Ryan. Uh, so is Harmony, who's running this. Um, we're, we're used to now, you know, working remotely. There might not be the same need for travel industry. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing in the long run. Of course, there's going to be some short-term pain for some industries as they adapt. But there's been instances throughout time where as things change, industries die off, new ones are introduced. And I, I think we've seen, as far as like technology goes, uh, we're, we're seeing certain companies, uh, as far as like video conferencing and what we're doing right now, really take off and you know, people start to, to realize that there might be a new normal when we come out on the other side of this. Now, we had some questions regarding uh, you know, the cash that we're holding and what would be a strategy or what would we be looking at as far as uh, you know, signals to get back in. And I think it's important to realize that the, uh, the investment process is one of probabilities and so nothing is ever going to be 100 percent clear uh because if it were then investing would be incredibly easy and you wouldn't need us um but what we look at the cash position in our portfolio is as somewhat of an insurance policy right and uh, right now we feel that the higher probability event is going to be a return maybe not to the absolute lows that we saw on march 23rd or 24th but more to, you know, again, that W-shaped recovery that I just mentioned, which we see it bounce around for a little while as we, you know, as we progress through this and as we get better ideas about where we might be headed. So certain things that we look at uh, when it comes to the, you know, levels or metrics or anything that you want to call it um, is right now, again, we, we've been in somewhat of a range and uh, it's fairly typical for after a steep decline. We saw it in the 20s, uh, 29 into 32. We saw it in 87, we saw it in 73 and 74. Typically there is a 50 to 60% bounce off the lows after the initial steep drawdown. So we're at that level right now. And so, as I mentioned, for the last two weeks, we've kind of bounced around in this level as market participants are figuring out where they wanna go and what they view the future is looking like. So I think if, if we were to see some positive news from, uh, you know, a, out of this consolidation area that would be a sign that things are headed back to at least you know some somewhat of a, a, a more normal setting and i think that you know if you're mar following the market on a daily basis you can tell that the, the last couple of weeks the last two weeks have been different from the beginning or different from the beginning of march where we really saw that just mass panic in the market as as people are kind of getting used to this new normal and we're seeing a lot less volatility and I mentioned the, the volatility index, I think, on our last webinar. Uh, it's something that gauges the potential volatility in the market. Sometimes it's referred to as the fear index. Um, it's the, the, the VIX. Uh, essentially, what that does is it looks at what the implied volatility is of the market for the next 30 days. And we see it right now at a level of about 38 today. And um, it was up around 85 at the, at the height of this crisis. So um, at, um, again, as we progress forward, seeing that come down, seeing you know uh, either a move upwards out of this range is something that's going to be positive and where we might be putting some cash to work. Um, and as far as a specific um, uh, specific investments, that's something that we discuss on a daily basis and and really looking at what's going to be you know the the most probable probable 
probabilistic uh, uh, um, investment that's going to be the, the best thing for our clients. Uh, so this is uh, absolutely something that we're staying in touch with, you know, each other. And then once we come to a decision, it's going to be something that we communicate to the to the clients. Um, and then there's also a uh, the question about um, Boucher Financial stock pickers. Yeah, okay, and a and set of parameters to buy back in. So it, it, it's very similar to to uh, to what I just mentioned um, regarding the um, you know certain levels on the S and P 500. We want to see much more breadth when it comes to participation. We've really seen this rally uh, as the function of a few different stocks. Uh, usually, strong, healthy markets are a function of uh, pretty broad-based recovery and we just haven't seen that from you know small caps we haven't seen it from certain sectors it, it's uh you know it's a few stocks that are pulling the weight in this recovery so uh, i want to thank everybody for writing in the, the questions uh you know as, and as we progress through this we always want to throw out there that if you ever have any questions you know we're always open to talk whether it be email phone call whatever uh it's it's something that we're we're here to to help out through everything Well, folks, that's going to wrap up our presentation for today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, again, if you have any specific questions regarding your personal situation, uh, we definitely ask you to reach out to us. We'll be in contact uh, with you as much as we can, and we'll continue communicating both uh, via email and additional webinars. Uh, have a great weekend, and uh, be safe and healthy. Thank you.